Hello, exiles. And maybe Nephilim? Honestly, I wouldn't want to be called a Nephilim. Back in my day, you didn't need an explanation for why you could challenge the devil. You were just some dude who kicked ass, and the ancients were a trio of good fellows who you had to lay the smackdown on to prove you were strong enough to challenge Bale. Still, it's as cool as anything else to go by, so we'll stick with it. So, Diablo Immoral happened. Blizzard managed to take what was legitimately a very impressive phone game, even if it being a phone game basically excluded my personal interest from it. It's still an impressive feat, and would deserve applause if it weren't for what they did with it. As of this recording, Quinn69 has spent over $18,000 New Zealand in the quest for a single 5-star gem. That's over $11,000 US, and he still hasn't gotten one. It's the most disgusting thing ever created for the phone game market, and you'll find the people playing every variety of exploitative gotcha game happy to point it out. Needless to say, this is a massive victory for Grinding Gear Games and Tencent. It's also an outright tragedy for the rest of us. Blizzard lowered the bar in a way that might be irreparable. What happens in the coming months and years is going to be very, very important, because your right to be respected as a consumer is on the line. Make no mistake, what Blizzard did was beyond wrong and objectively unethical. The problem here is that it was so far over the line, and now the concept of a compromise for what's acceptable might drastically shift for the worse. Of course, it's probably hard for most people to imagine a situation where GGG goes the way of Blizzard, but long ago, when I was young and naive, Blizzard was an infallible god that could take any idea a competitor had and just do it better. People are still playing the original Diablo, Diablo 2, Starcraft, Warcraft 2, and Warcraft 3, but after the era of those games' release, a very subtle decline began. For starters, they weren't releasing games as often. They made World of Warcraft, which was arguably their greatest triumph ever, and that seems to have become the sole focus of the company. But World of Warcraft isn't the king of the MMO genre anymore, and it slowly poisoned itself to get there. Diablo 3 was poorly received by many, so much so that Path of Exile itself was founded on the idea of being a true spiritual successor to Diablo 2. Starcraft 2 was the same, with huge portions of the population choosing to stay with Starcraft Brood War, and even now, StarCraft Brood War is a hugely successful competitive game, and the gold standard in what a competitive real-time strategy game should be, even if Blizzard is doing a piss-poor job of managing the remaster's ladder scene. Overwatch arrived loudly and died quietly, and Overwatch 2 has no one excited. Diablo Immortal was a train wreck, and now Diablo 4 is being written off by a generation of gamers who don't want to get fooled again. You might not feel that way about Diablo 4, but the number of people not interested has most certainly more than doubled. Remember though, at the start of all of this, Blizzard Entertainment was one of, if not the best video game development companies in the world. Now we have Grinding Gear Games, and Path of Exile. There's some similarities to Blizzard's downfall that I'm sure the Observant have been leery of for a while. Tencent's acquisition feels a whole lot like Activision's merger. You probably feel like that hasn't been a big issue, but Activision's merger didn't at the time either. As a literal god is wont to say, you're like a frog to them, and they're boiling you slowly. To this end, Grinding Gear Games needs our scrutiny and vigilance more than ever. The thought of that company becoming like Blizzard is heartbreaking, and I say that with absolute sincerity. There is no one at Blizzard who cares about their customers, and that's a fact. You can argue the developers are passionate, and you'd be right, but they aren't Blizzard. They're passionate game developers filling out their resume, which is just one of many things Blizzard abuses to fill their offices for cheap. Don't believe me? Look up the employee reviews. Great people and great company culture, but low pay and poor management, which itself is accused of bullying people into burnouts constantly. If those passionate people had any say in the greater scope of these games, they wouldn't let focus groups and metrics based around milking additional playtime for their players dictate the way they structure their games, which any avid WoW player of the last five years will tell you is something they definitely do. Grinding Gear Games is not at the point of Blizzard, and that's great. That said, it's important to remember that Blizzard is tremendously gone. They aren't even a shadow of their former selves, they're the eraser tool. You can see this in a company by its executive culture. That is to say, if a company keeps making really shitty decisions that cause huge outcry in their consumer base, but no one ever suffers consequences for it, it means no one is actually held accountable. They might even be celebrated for it. There's no care for how the customers feel, they just want to feel assured that they're making as much money as they can. It's a cold, heartless bitch of a situation, and coming to terms with it will help you realize why no matter how badly Blizzard fucks something up, nothing ever seems to change. Microsoft's acquisition might have an effect on this, but that disgusting executive culture might actually be the thing they find most appealing also. 
So, how does this apply to now, to Path of Exile? Why raise us think about grinding gear games? I'll be honest, with Chris Wilson at the helm, things will probably never go completely into the shitter. Chris Wilson might not be around forever to keep that OG gamer perspective at the head of the company, though. What's more, anti-consumer business practices are something we definitely have in Path of Exile. They're there. Anyone who has played for a long time felt their impact when they arrived. But just for being thorough, let's list off some of the highlights. Premium Stash Tabs. Yes, these are first. Trade integration through the API was a big deal, much celebrated, and for good reason. But even now, there's no way for a free-to-play player to access that trade function in-game. They have to make a forum post and do it the old, old-fashioned way. Streamer, professional ripper, and community event organizer Zizarin has made great commentary on this issue over the years, and I want to put forward his idea to upgrade one tab to premium, or to just give players a one-off free premium tab when they kill Kitaba for the first time. Loot boxes. Nothing says anti-consumer like literal gambling. Admittedly, these are probably the least offensive loot boxes out there. There's no player power in them, and their contents become available on the store after their run ends. I, I think. If they haven't done this somewhere and someone corrects me in the comments, they'll win the pin. Recently, they've even made it impossible to get duplicate outcomes. This definitely is a step towards not gambling, but offering more expensive MTX as a maybe at a cheaper price is still a predatory psychological trick to drive sales. Honestly, this one doesn't bother me all that much personally, but I think people with gambling addictions might feel differently. If you have this addiction, you can actually contact GGG and have them disable the ability to purchase these on your account, which is another plus one for how they're handling this. The Curac Vault Pass. This is it. This is the one to really make us think about, and to demand action on. As bad as gambling is, FOMO is worse. FOMO is fear of missing out and it's what the Kirak Vault Pass exists to instill in you. This text comes right from the pathofexile.com slash vault webpage. Are the pass, or its cosmetic unique item skins, available after this league ends? No. The pass can only be purchased during this league, and its cosmetic unique item skins are exclusive to this pass. They will not be available again. If you want to have them in your collection forever, you must purchase the pass, this league, and complete the objectives for any skins that you want. In the future, we may release different cosmetic unique item skins for the same unique items. Notice how upfront they are about it. They tout the exclusivity as a bonus and incentive, while remaining entirely oblivious to how it taints their brand for future players who will never receive the opportunity to buy that given vault pass. Eight cosmetics, nice ones at that, for $30 isn't too bad a value by Poe's standards. But the way the vault pass works is the truly insidious part. I went on a rant about Blizzard caring more about metrics to keep people playing than anything else for a reason. The vault pass isn't permanent. Buying a given pass does not guarantee you the items, it only gives you access to them if you complete enough of your atlas, that league. Can I pay more money to unlock rewards that I have not been able to unlock through gameplay? You can't pay to unlock rewards, other than the first one, which comes with the pass. Everyone you see with one of the unique item skins from Karax Vault will have completed the bonus objectives required to earn it. Again, they're up front, even trying to give off the implication that there is to be some pride in having earned the unique item skins. On top of that, this information is hidden in a way to deflect criticism, because they want you focusing on the fact that people can't pay more money to achieve the task they're selling you the privilege to undertake. Now, full disclosure for people who think I'm just lazy. I will never purchase a FOMO product under any circumstances. Additionally, I have completed my atlas, so purchasing that pass would give me everything. This isn't me complaining that it's hard to fill out. That said, I am complaining that they try to make the vault pass seem like it's an achievement to complete because they basically tricked you into paying money to keep playing the game. They are milking the casual player, the same as Blizzard by using tactics to try and force people to play the game longer. It's different than the free challenges, because you're invested now, you've committed money to the task, and if you don't finish it, you don't get paid back a portion of the money relative to the amount of unclaimed items. I want to now talk about a man who's no longer with us. A man who, long ago, made a very important video about something that I honestly can't even directly talk about. It was another time, and the language you could use was a little more colorful, but many will recognize it as T-R-H. That man was Total Biscuit, and he called Blizzard out for the sparkly garbage horse that was clearly just invincible with Algalon the Observer's cool astral star effect for a body. Why did he call them out? Because it was the first mount they started selling for real-world dollars. It was added in March of 2010, and it cost $25 American. There are currently 23 mounts in the Blizzard store, but they often retire mounts so that they can generate FOMO on the idea of you never being able to acquire them again. It's a disgusting practice, and content that should be offered is an achievement in a game people are already paying a monthly subscription fee for. 
Kirak's battle pass is no different, and GGG has to change it. I'm not kidding, if they're willing to get money out of you like this, they'll keep doing it the same way. If the vault pass makes them enough money, it's a real short road to making it take longer to fill out the atlas, because they know people are invested and don't want to lose out on the money they spent. People don't buy from the game shop if they're not playing, so even if there isn't a subscription fee, it's better for their bottom line to find ways to make people play longer. That in itself is the crux of the issue here. Karax Vault Pass is a method of making people play longer outside the scope of just making a better game. I think everyone has experienced what happens when a game finds a way to make more money that doesn't involve making the game better. Hint, they do more of it. Demand change. Hold them accountable. I'm not even asking for the pass to change or be removed, just continue offering it as a bundle after the fact that you can complete at any time, or sell each individual item at a higher price. Don't let them fool you. The exclusivity is just as much a shield to maintain the status quo as it is a buying incentive. They want the people who have bought the pass to be there to complain if this comes up. And you know what? That's fine. What's done is done. Those skins already in the game can stay exclusive to the end of time. It's a very small blemish on one of the greatest games ever made, and it's still early in the Vault Pass's existence. The best time to change the Vault Pass was before it released. The second best time to change it is now.